Hi. Well, it seems that there is no shortage of musings. First, I want to say there is a part two coming up regarding the multidimensional mobbing. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait to share that very shortly. But in this recording, I wanted to give voice to what I believe are three unmet needs and ways that we could meet them. So the first unmet need that came to my attention recently is touch. That's a basic human need. The reason it was it, that it kind of came to my attention is because of, of this word that I ran across in reading, and then something in that word triggered explosive curiosity, and then that was the rabbit hole that opened up this stuff about touch. And the word is haptic. Or haptics, H A P T I C S. It has to do with sensory touch, with screens, with the way that we interact with smart devices. That's all haptic, and it's the technology. It's the technology of touch, really. And so I got to thinking about that because I'm noticing how much. Fusion is going on between humans and technology. It's just, I don't know. Like it, it just seems to be part of our current reality and part of our, I guess, our evolution. And I am not entirely comfortable with it, with all aspects of it. And so, you know, like the idea of being chipped and the idea of being modified. In ways that feel rushed, hasty, not fully examined, definitely not filtered with ethics or morality. It's just like, boom, let's just merge and become cyborgs. And I'm kind of like, wait, we, you know, the soul, the spirit, still has not even been brought into the conversation. I'm not okay with that. So I guess that's kind of why my radars are like, Wah! you know, with the so with the haptics, it came to my attention that I interact with screens in terms of touch time. If you were to consider how much of your day or evening includes being touched by another, and I'm not talking in lewdness or sexuality even, okay? Because most touch is not sexual. And so, touch should not necessarily shouldn't be sexualized. So, even though haptics is what it was the launching pad, but it it brought me to the ultimate human need from you know as infants, living organism, known to die without a sufficient amount of it. There's plenty of science that shows that it is a basic need for flourishing. And so, under the circumstances, and the circumstances are very complicated. It's for all of these challenges at relationship, whether the challenge is fear of virus, fear of ideology, fear of politics, whatever that fear is, there are these barriers that are blocking hugs, <laughs> and they're blocking. Connection. I think I'm saying these things even for my own benefit, because the silence is deafening. So I'm saying the things I need to hear, and I trust that it is serving others also. Because I know I'm not the only one to feel this way. For whatever reason, your circumstances, particularly people who live alone, a lot of society is. Tipped and tilted toward herd. It's like, look at these packs of people. All these packs of people. It seems like a lot of perspectives that get play, that get platform, are usually clustered. They involve groups of people. They're herd. So you don't. So it's not like the loner is necessarily featured. But I think that the world is made up of a lot of loners, and so. For those who are in households of one, and you may be single, and you may hold ideals about life that counter 
the dominant narrative. And so you have been living life alone. I'm talking to you. There's two things that I've been doing as someone who's in that circumstance. One thing that you can do, massage. Acknowledging the need. Seeing it as something essential to our humanity. And even if it's that you would massage yourself as you shower, as you moisturize, you do so with attention and with mindfulness. You're aware of the circles that you make as you lather, as you oil, okay? Even just by paying attention to that, to the motion of cleansing, to the motion of moisturizing, it becomes a nourishing activity. So that shower time can become that wholesome, needed, haptic, so that you're not just touching screens. And the other is, this won't work for all households, but for some, that if you don't have allergies, then you may consider adopting an animal companion. I mean, birds you can't hug, but cats and dogs you can. My closest friend is a feline, and hugs with him have kept me grounded and soft because I could see how a calcification can happen. I see how people can become crusty. I think that you get crusted when you go too long without wholesome touch. Even if that, as I said, even if that touch is just you paying attention to yourself during your grooming and your hygiene, but that turns it into a bit of a ritual and it steps it up and it becomes multidimensional. So you're not just doing it to your flesh body, you're doing it also to these other aspects of yourself. That's the truth. You're also cleansing and moisturizing your emotions your thinker. I don't know, in some people the thinker might be a little too relaxed and inactive. <laughs> but in some the thinker is overactive. It just works through you to your inner part. Okay, so that was one unmet need, touch. Let me see the other two that are connected to that. I mean, they all swirl together, but it's witness and shared reality. If you are someone who is, you don't have access to touch, well then it's possible that you also don't have access to, or haven't been experiencing, I should say, haven't been experiencing witness and also shared reality. The witness is just, do you have eyeballs, loving, caring eyeballs in your life that can say, way to go, when you have a win, or that can say, ah, oh, babe, when you have a loss. If you don't, then that is a different kind of hunger. The hunger for, and I don't mean like, not the empty calorie stuff, not social media approval, which is like, that's like cotton candy. It's a sugar high. You're still hungry, in my opinion. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I mean, maybe I'm. I'm probably biased because I, I've been in a state of confusion about social media since it began, so. Okay, so the remedy that I've been tapping into for the witness, two different kinds, and they're the opposite, but I find that I need them both. One is I ask for it in my friendships, and so that is just literally saying to a trusted person that I know loves me and cares about my, my well-being is that I just ask for the time and space to be heard. That's one direct way. The other way, and this is the way that I have been leaning more into, it's different, but anyway, I shift it so I realize that, it, that I feel this hunger or desire of some sort to be seen, to be acknowledged, and I guess in its innocence, it looks like the child that's saying, mommy, mommy, look, and they've got their hand raised. They're just so excited and so jazzed about life in general, and they're just like, look, look, look. 
hardwired desire to be acknowledged. If a human has a basic need, then it really does not make sense to demonize that need. Why would we demonize hydration, demonize water drinking? We need it to live. So it just is not, it doesn't even make any sense to establish a belief that would demonize a need that you have for wellness. <laughs> so so I'm saying like, I know that it could, that it could go toxic, then that's probably where things like a narcissist or harmful, selfish behavior can creep in. But that desire to have your existence acknowledged, I think is basic. I think also that we're not necessarily equipped with like knowing how to be a good witness. Everyone is playing the child, but where are the mothers, <laughs> right? So we need the developed eye. We need the beholder. And it feels like a big ask with the, the strain that we're living under and the unusualness of this time. And then you go and you bring to your friend, oh, please witness me. So I've asked the sky to be my, I guess you could say like my go-to. And seriously now, the, the, and this goes to show how powerful the mind is and how it will work with what you give it. If you have a belief or a conviction, your mind will accept it. And for me, it is plausible that the sky, both day and night, the sky above has no problem bearing witness to my stuff. My little mundane stuff right here. The day sky and the night sky, they're so big and expansive and they're in no hurry and they always say, okay, and I never feel that I'm infringing. I never feel that I'm taking too long to say my stuff. <laughs> I I guess this is called anthropomorphizing. I think that's the word for it, where, where you project human qualities on non-human things. There is usefulness in that. I'm not saying that I turned it, the sky into a god. It's not like a sky god, but it is that, and maybe this is because I spend time looking at the sky. I look above. I look, I look. And so it made sense that it would become, I guess, an object of fascination and then eventually an object of relation. So that's a possibility. Most of nature is very, very happy to be your witness. This is where tree hugger, the term tree hugger comes from. A tree hugger is someone who came into the knowledge and the experience that they can not just inform, but they can witness. Basically, I'm saying that humans are not the only ones who can do it. So we don't, so that if, again, back to this household of one and in these unusual times that have created more extreme pockets of felt isolation and isolation that goes beyond what governments have wrongly put into place, but the aftermath of competing beliefs and opinions and that and just like the division these are just dividing times so it's like whew, you know many people are feeling alone and even if they're still in their same networks they feel alone within the network that's what i'm speaking to there are people there are good loving generous exp expansive giving people in my life and so when I do have need, I will just directly ask for it. Hey, could you make some time for, for a chat? And they allow me that. But as I said, I don't want to, I'm aware of not wanting to become a burden, not wanting to al allow myself to become a burden. So I do self-regulate. And that's how I came to find the sky to be a wonderful resource. And also the sea is another resource. The sea bears witness. The sea has held and received so many of my tears, so much of my sorrow is joined now with the Caribbean Sea. And so there's a relation established 
let's say weeks or months later, as I look at the sea and I and reflect on the waves and my sorrow that dissipated, transformed, evaporated. And now it's dew comes back on me and brings joy. Oh. So all witness doesn't have to be human. And then the last bit, the third unmet need that I have been feeling, and I know many, many others are as well, and that is of a shared reality. These times are so polarized. The reality is so polarized and electric that literally in one household, one person could believe that this path leads to freedom and health. And then one door over in the same household, another member believes the exact opposite, that that path leads to death and enslavement. <laughs> and they are both, if you were to monitor their conviction, they are equally convinced that they're right. So like wherever you may land, whichever side you may land on, that, that should at least give you pause. Wow, how can that be that reality is the literal opposite for people? You almost have to say, you know, like, what color is your sky? <laughs> so what that has done is it's brought about, like, I think, I mean, for me, it brought about shock. As this polarizing effect does its thing, it's reorganizing, it's reordering, and it's creating new constellations. So, to the person who feels extremely isolated or alone, the solution that I am starting to take my <laughs> tap into is acknowledging that I have been in a process of social reorganization. So that clarifies a lot like, okay, yes, all things social have been reorganized and they were shaken until there was like nothing left and now I'm at ground zero. This is the place from which I am building. And that is what you can do too. You can accept whatever losses there were. And it's not even a loss. It's a graduation. It's a, an amicable farewell. I don't know. You know what? I mean, it, it's growth. <laughs> and I do understand that there's, let, let, the, let whatever grief arises, respect it. Allow it. Release it to the sky, release it to the sea. Let them transmute it for you. They're happy to. That's been my experience. They're not burdened by it. And you will feel amazing to release it. And so you acknowledge and say, ah, okay, now in my newness, who's there, who's here? I know that I was feeling alone in my reality, but I know that I'm not. I can see resonant signals. If anything, they're very clear. It's startlingly clear where your resonant signal checks in and where it doesn't. And you just reorder your steps accordingly. It's that simple. Now I desire to share reality. I don't want to just inhabit it I want to share it so for me it is just now starting to shift by realizing that I can allow and release the reordering of things it hurts and it's necessary it's a part of my process it's a part of their process so I'm not at odds with it I'm allowing it and then at the same time, I'm, in, I'm making room for what fits now. It's actually easier than ever. So that's one of the upsides of polarization is that it makes your resonant lights or signals really obvious because it's all tuned up. Everything's amplified. So if it's in harmony, it's going to be clear immediately. And if it is not in harmony, it will be equally clear immediately. So even though the polarization has been difficult to live through, because it means like, oh my gosh, just such an extreme separating 
which is hurtful. But the upside is that it makes the resonant affinity people very easy to find. And then the joyful task becomes finding them and connecting with them. That wraps up three unmet needs and the way that I've been addressing them.